Good morning. It's great to be with you this morning for the online worship service of the Pleasant Grove Church of Christ. Through the years, I haven't had the best luck buying cars. I've tried to do my research to find a vehicle that would last, but I either end up with a lemon or something happens that forces the need for a replacement. My current vehicle, I just let my wife Annie buy for me, and so far, it's been a great one. My car before this one was a Subaru Outback Wagon. When I was thinking about buying it, I learned that there were more Subarus on the road still with 300,000 miles or more than any other vehicle. I thought I should at least be able to get 200,000 out of it, and that was wishful thinking. Unbeknownst to me, there was a bearing that was beginning to go bad that held a belt that held a pulley. I occasionally caught a whiff of hot rubber, and I even had it checked out a few times to see if they could figure out what was going on, and no one seemed to be able to figure it out. Then, one day, the car just quit working. The pulley had slid out just enough to wear out the belt that was on it. And when the belt broke, pieces flew everywhere, including into the timing chain, which then jumped three or four sprockets. Now, I don't know a whole lot about engines, but I'm told that that's a very bad thing. And my Subaru went to an early grave with only about 130,000 miles on it. The worst part about it is I had a feeling that something was wrong, but everyone around me was assuring me that things were fine. And then, it wasn't. With the pulse of John 3.16, Jesus deals with the heart of our problem. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son. Part of our struggle in this life is that we often think we don't need anything from God. We lead a good life. We have a good job. Those around us respect us. Those closest to us, they love us. We don't think we need what God offers. We don't think we need His Son. Maybe that's how we feel right now. Sure, we appreciate what Jesus taught. We may even admire His example. But we just can't quite figure out why Jesus had to go to such extremes when we're really not that bad of people. I'd even say we're pretty good most of the time. How can Jesus' death mean life for us? The answer is found in the heart, ours and his. Upon examination, we may be overestimating the condition of our hearts. In fact, God spoke through the prophet Jeremiah in chapter 17, verse 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? Then Jesus added in Mark chapter 7, verses 20 through 23. What comes out of a person is what defiles them. For it is from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come. Sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these evils come from inside and defile a person. There's something wrong deep within us, and we may not even be aware of it. Paul describes our plight in pandemic proportions in Romans chapter 3 verses 10 and 11, when he quotes King David. There is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. Is it possible that we all have one foot in the grave? Yet most of us don't even have a clue that anything is wrong, thinking we've got another 170,000 miles in us when reality is we're just one broken belt away from destruction. Could it be true? As Paul put it in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, 
for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Our world has become polarized about sin. We tend to fall to one extreme or the other. Either we're boisterous that sin really isn't sin, trying to justify it by shouting the loudest, or we rant about everyone else's sin while pretending that we've never messed up. Scripture touts a different tune. It tells us we all have a problem called sin, and it's universal. While we all struggle with sin, it's also a very personal issue. God judges us on our choices, not on the choices of the person sitting next to us. So how do our choices measure up with God's standard? If we asked ourselves how God expects us to live, we could probably all agree that the Big Ten, God's Ten Commandments, would be a good place to start. As followers of Jesus, we ought to score pretty well on God's basic laws. Let's look at a few and see how we do. God tells us in Exodus chapter 20, verse 15, You shall not steal. Have you ever stolen something? an ink pen, or parking place? Well, then you're a thief. In Exodus chapter 20, verse 16, God tells us, You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. Have you ever lied? If you claim you haven't, chances are you just did. He tells us in Exodus chapter 20, verse 14, You shall not commit adultery. Jesus explained during his Sermon on the Mount that if we even look at someone with lust in our heart, we've committed adultery. In our sex-crazed world, keeping this commandment just got a lot harder. In Exodus chapter 20, verse 13, he, sa- he tells us, You shall not murder. Before you claim your innocence on this one, you should remember that Jesus equates murder with ungodly anger. He said in Matthew chapter 5 verse 22, but I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, is answerable to the court, and anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. In that case, We assassinate about a half dozen drivers on our way to the store each week. The bad news about our choices that we make is that we're thieving, lying, adulterous murderers. Contrast that with the heart of Jesus. Amidst his various claims, we find this one in John chapter 8 verse 46. Can any of you prove me guilty of sin? If I am telling the truth, why don't you believe me? Tell you what, I don't think I'd want to give that challenge to those around me. And I wouldn't recommend that you do it either. People would come out of the woodwork in droves to accuse us. Yet, When Jesus challenged the Jewish leaders, who, by the way, were trying to discredit him, not one of them could convict him of a single sin. His enemies had to create false charges to arrest him. Pilate, the highest-ranking Roman official in the region, found him innocent. Peter, who walked in Jesus' shadow for three years, said in 1 Peter 2, verse 22, He committed no sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. Jesus lived in a way that was beyond compare. His life silences any boasting we might do about how good we think we are. I used to think I was quite a singer. When I was younger, I would say I was even a bit arrogant about it. Then, I went a few to a few concerts and heard what the pros can do. 
Several years back, I went to a Newsboys concert and heard the power behind Michael Tate's voice. And after the concert, I was standing there waiting for him to autograph the CD that I had just purchased, and I could barely even string two words together. There before me was a group of guys who at that time had been nominated for, for a Grammy on four occasions and a Dove Award 26 times, winning five of those. Their talent silenced me. Jesus' perfection should silence us. So how does Jesus respond to the vileness of our hearts? Can God simply overlook our sins as innocent mistakes? I wish he could, but in his holiness, he can't. He is the one and only judge. He sets forth laws, not opinions, commands, not suggestions. They are righteous and true, and they flow from his perfection. When we violate them, we're violating the essence of who he is a violation that comes at the greatest of costs. The writer of Hebrews was blunt about it in chapter 12, verse 14 of their book. Make every effort to live in peace with everyone, and to be holy without holiness, no one will see the Lord. The hard-hearted won't be found in heaven. Jesus explained in Matthew chapter 5, verse 8, it's the pure in heart who will see God. Where does that leave us? It leaves us drawing hope from a five-letter Greek word, hyper. It means in place of or on behalf of. The New Testament writers repeatedly turned to this little preposition to describe the work of Christ. Jesus died for our sins. He became a curse for us. As our shepherd, he laid his life down for us as his sheep. He sacrificed his body and poured out his blood for each of us. This little Greek word is crucial. It tells us that Jesus exchanged his pure heart for our vileness, our thieving lying, adulterous, murdering hearts. He takes our sin on himself and invites God to punish him in our place. In Isaiah chapter 53, verse 6, the prophet put it this way, We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Many of you know my mother-in-law had a heart transplant a little over a year ago. She had suffered from cardiomyopathy that robbed her of her energy pretty much all her life. Even medicated, she had gradually deteriorated to the point she was sleeping nearly all the time. And after a visit with the grandkids, she was struggling to even get back to her previous low level of energy and so she went in to get checked out. And after a bunch of tests, they told her that she shouldn't have even been able to walk. And she would not be leaving the hospital without a new heart. A transplant, particularly a heart transplant, is a hard thing to get your head around. For it to happen, someone else, in a sense, must take your malady on themselves, bearing the result of your illness. They have to die so you can live. Though Jesus was healthy, he took our disease on himself, dying on the cross in our place. Though we were riddled with disease, Jesus willingly gives us his pure heart, pronouncing us healthy, not just pardoned, but innocent. We enter heaven, not with hearts that have been healed, but with his heart, as if we had never sinned in the first place. Listen to how Paul put it in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. 
the new is here. We're not just pardoned, we're proclaimed innocent. Paul went on in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Our best efforts to live well enough just aren't enough. We're living under the pandemic of sin. We've all fallen short of God's glory. And we need a Savior to bring us back into relationship with our Heavenly Father. Before my mother-in-law realized just how bad her situation had gotten, she and I were talking about the possibility of one day possibly having a transplant. And she wasn't sure she wanted to do it because it meant that someone else had to die. I asked her if she would just let their sacrifice go to waste. They had committed to give their heart if something unforeseen took place in their life. Jesus knew what was coming. He knew what he had committed to do. And he sacrificed himself willingly on the cross to give you his heart. My challenge for you today is to not let his sacrifice go to waste. Claim Jesus' offer of his pure heart in exchange for your vileness. Clothe yourself with Christ today through the waters of baptism, joining him in his death, burial, and resurrection claiming the new life he is offering. This brings us to a time of communion, a time when we share together with one another as well as with Christ. In preparation for this time of the Lord's Supper, as you gather your bread and your juice, I'd like to read a passage of Scripture from 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 22 through 25. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth, so that you have sincere love for each other, love one another deeply from the heart. For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. For all people are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers, and the flowers fall. But the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word that was preached to you. We sometimes don't think about just how frail our lives truly are. In a realization of our own frailness, the shortness of our lifespan, it helps us to recognize the urgency that is laid on each of us. As those who have claimed the sacrifice of Jesus in our lives, we have an urgency to share the message of what Jesus has done and what he has done for those around us. And so today, as we remember Jesus' sacrifice, his death on the cross, his broken body, his shed blood for our sins, we remember not simply his sacrifice, but that our lives are but a wisp of vapor. And that in Him, our lives are filled with purpose and meaning. And so we ask that we simply not live for today, but we live for eternity. That we would bring glory to our Heavenly Father as we Make Jesus' sacrifice known to those around us. Fulfill his mission for us as we proclaim Jesus' death, 
his burial, and his resurrection, the new life that he has given to us in Christ. And so, let's partake of this bread that represents Jesus' broken body there on the cross. And the juice that represents his shed blood of forgiveness for each of us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you that you give our lives meaning. We thank you that through the sacrifice of your Son on the cross, as we have claimed his broken body, his shed blood, that our lives have purpose. That he charges us with his commission to share all that he has done and all that he has taught with those around us. And Father, may you fill our lives with urgency as we recognize the frailness of our own lives, that our lives are but a vapor in the wind. And Father, may, may we truly take that seriously and share with those around us. And Father, work in us and through us. Forgive us of our sins and give us the strength to overcome the temptations we will face this next week. And Father, may you be glorified through all that we say and do. And we pray these things in your Son's name, Jesus. Amen. I thank you for the opportunity to share the message of God's Word with you today. And I look forward to the next time, either in person, beginning with our Sunday school hour at 9.30, followed by our worship service at 10.30 each week at the Pleasant Grove Church of Christ in Southeast Minnesota, or once again right back here online, initially posted at 11 a.m. on our Facebook page and reposted on our Facebook page, our YouTube channel as well as our website, thepleasantgrovechurchofchrist.com. If you would like to help support the ministry of the Pleasant Grove Church of Christ, you can do so by sending either your tithes or offerings to the address on the screen beside me. You can also find this address at pleasantgrovechurchofchrist.com, along with much, much more for your spiritual growth and development. God bless, and stay well.